Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Hello. Beautiful, beautiful. It's my honor to be here. Um, uh, I'm here to share some creative work with you um, that, that I call poetry. Some may call spoken word um, or performance art. And it, um, in honor of this event and all of the stories and, and all of the, the talks that are being shared, we're going to call this the art of spoken word storytelling. Because one of the things that I particularly do is I try to address issues, concerns, and things that we as human beings go through every day through stories. I feel like if I can present a tangible example of how these things play out, then it gives us a better understanding. So if you don't mind, I'm going to tell you some stories of some people you may know you, that may seem very familiar, or it may be you. So let's start, let's start with uh, inspiration um, from some place that I think we might all be familiar with, and that's Knife Street. <coughs> There's an old man wearing a Technicolor dream coat at a street corner named Desire on a bench outside of an old laundromat. He has a concrete sign that reads before and after, plays a banjo covered in superhero band-aids. His once full head of hair is now broken homes and bulimia, tattered rainforest down his cheek, eyes Caribbean blue, skin commercial beach. You would think him all of society's transgressions until you see him smile, all Sunday choir robe clean. He speaks in staccato. His lips are the Nicholas Brothers. The words he offers are stormy weather dancing, spoken in syncopation to the fleeting optimism in my spirit. I want to give him a couple of dollars. He wants to give me a couple pieces of advice. I say it's a fair trade. I bought it my time for worse. I expect a story. What I get is a revelation. He asks me what I do. I say that I'm a poet. He laughs. Then he rises from that bench like Suleiman, rising from the throne of a collapsing empire in Constantinople, places Marion Barry and Clarence Thomas in front of me. Reaches to the noose holding his black pants up, pulls out a plastic flower, and he hands it to me. We say we want our roses while we can still smell them. But if they're fake, it's sort of like intention without fruition, like dreams of no ambition. What good is appreciation if it's not real? But then again. Sitcoms have laugh tracks after enough episodes that you wonder if you're really funny or just become content with knowing that there will always be laughter as hands dance. Fingers like the Temptations and the Spinners. I noticed that David Ruffin had trouble keeping up the steps. His left forefinger had been broken before, probably from holding the truth. The ability to point out other people's mistakes, he reached into his coat pocket. He pulled out an old watch, 14 karat, covered in forgotten currency. It was sunburnt, broken with arms stuck in an empty embrace. We have all had our face cracked, been ashamed, embarrassed, had our reputation tarnished by bad decisions, been stuck in a moment unable to recognize times have changed, but we are all made of valuable material, and two times a day we are perfect, so there is always hope. So now I'm standing there, holding a false promise and a lost opportunity, with a look on my face as blank as Herman Cain's NAACP application. <laughs> And I am looking at an old man laughing like juke joint scamps playing a jug band rendition of ragtime in his belly. I am so confused, yet I am so aware. I want to give them back, but I can't. I did, but I didn't. He knows that. Knows that there are no refunds, no exchanges. These symbols have already begun to be used. This composition has already begun to be written. See, he taught me about judgment about finding blessings where you least expect to find them, about knowing that wisdom sometimes comes when everything crumbles around you so in honor of that ill-gotten ghostwriter, whenever I deliver this poem, I make sure that everybody knows who actually wrote it. Thank you. So we'll continue on. We'll continue on. And we'll go from that street artist into um, a wedding where there's someone who seems to be so eager to talk to everybody in the room and he stumbles into a guy like me who really doesn't want to talk to anybody. And the story he ends up telling me is probably one of the most amazing I've ever heard. He used to always get things backwards, like the I love you that found his lips after she closed the door. So he tattooed an open door over his heart so he would never forget again. Now he goes in and out of relationships, unable to shut out his fear of commitment. There is a small studio apartment in his chest with no furniture and hardwood floors, feng shui feels fraudulent because he's not comfortable with who he really is. 
So he spends his afternoons in bars like Ikea searching for someone who fits. He used to always get things mixed up. Like the cubicle that should have been a dream, hideaway that should have been a home, acquaintances like Section 8 housing, always on his bad side. Felt they couldn't afford to be his friend. He couldn't let them near where his heart lived. He was afraid they'd bring down the value. It started when he was a child. His world was beautifully placed, disparate, until they told him it was confusion. Said that there were gaps missing in his stories. He said those stories were riddles and he was supposed to solve them like Oedipus. They told him he had a complex. He said, I ain't got no mother effing problem. They disliked the difference between his understanding and his achievement. They labeled him developmentally disabled, called his parents, said your son is dyslexic. He didn't open a book again for four years. He got good at mimicking, life imitating art, but this isn't realism, it's an abstract impression of fitting in. He Jackson Pollock High School, framed it as a necessary evil, exhibiting no remorse until needles started pricking his skin, painting heroin hued portraits on pointillism. A fanatic Surratt working with the withering canvas, he was addicted for four years. Four years out of rehab, he finally found the answer. Figured out how to read the pages of this novel existence that God had written for him. See, he's dyslexic. Reverses letters and numbers, struggles with symbols, but believes he's better this way without the preconceived notions of this world. He called his lost lover, said, you can come home now. I know that love is still possible because you and I is no less gratifying reverse. See, he traded in that cubicle for a Barnes and Noble badge. Books are his life now. So he perfect binds days that begin and end the same way with prayer. This faithful autobiography is printed in his daydreams and distributed in his smile. He is a modern day Aesop who dove off the cliff of doubt with rebellion on his tongue so that he can inspire the next young dreamer to believe in happy endings. He wondered if God broke apart his reality to test his faith or his ingenuity, but he has finally found the glue to piece his piece back together. He used to always get things backwards, like the F U that found his lips 12 years after they tried to tell him a piece of God's craftsmanship was defective. So he tattooed a middle finger on his upper arm so when he, give co he gives doubters the cold shoulder, <laughs> they will know why. So there is a small studio apartment in his chest. It is accident and determination and fully furnished with hope. Feng Shui feels like freedom because he's comfortable with who he really is. So now he spends his afternoons in bookstores searching for an adventure that fits. All right, thank you so much. I only have a couple more, a couple more stories to tell you. And we're gonna just jump around, jump around this town and continue to run into some of these amazing people. Um, and there's a, we now, we, we're this sort of an offhand story because there's a young man, a very talented writer, who is looking for something new to write about. And he's giving this prompt. What if the word ugly all this time has really meant beautiful? He's like, yeah, no, I don't want to write about that. <laughs> and so uh, I was left with a quandary. I like the idea. I think this is the greatest prompt ever. You sure you don't want to write about it? No. Fine. Well, hey, guess what? This is what happens when you're left with an idea that nobody else wants to take. So this is my story. Starts with a quote by Oscar Wilde. There's nothing in the world that is so beautiful that under certain conditions it won't appear ugly. And I found it to be prophetic and I offer it to you now as I ask you to consider what might seem to be a far-fetched idea. I've been studying the etymology and I'm starting to see inconsistencies and I wonder if the standard was created to maintain a false sense of identity. What if ugly really meant beautiful? Hold on pretty people, just bear me for a moment. The word manufacture used to mean made by hands before the brands of industry made it synonymous with mechanated revolution. They used to say brave meant crooked, savage, wicked, depraved. The brave new world wasn't a compliment. It was a warning, but that was before the raping and pillaging of Native Americans became regarded as a heroic accomplishment. I mean, what if ugly really meant beautiful? I looked it up. The word ugly is older than pretty, gorgeous. Is it fair? Yes, take a moment at my the double entendre I just used. I call it subterfuge, not what I just did, but what they're doing to us. See, the word ugly is older than attractive, alluring, appealing, sexy. They say it used to mean hateful, dreadful, fearful, all. Seems to me that someone was just upset. No one wanted to conform to their narrow-minded perceptions of appearance. We're not talking about goblins and demons. We're talking about self-determination, self-awareness, and self-confidence. So why don't we all just want to be ugly? It's a dastardly trick. 
They know that we are afraid of homonyms, homophones, you know, words that are spelled the same and sound the same but have different meaning. Bank, chase, slink, slip, ugly. Pugs, ugly. Knee along, ugly. I'm just saying. <laughs> Enthusiasm used to mean possessed by God. Now it means possessed by the demons of materialism and commodity. Have you noticed how the wolves of Wall Street tried to put a red riding hood on Obama and turn Mao into Rupert Stilskin trying to take your first piece of American apple pie for turning working class idealism into self-determination? Hmm. First King James and now this. They know the error in their ways. They got me using statements like diamond in the rough, like the coal around the diamond ain't black. But if I mention fool's gold, don't nobody want to talk about that? In these fairy tales, the ugly duckling who turns into a swan. Um, hold up, Mr. Hans Christian Anderson, who told the swan it was an ugly duckling in the first place? So a long neck, short legs, and broad build is beautiful on a swan, but fellas, on any one of us, that is not Denzel Washington or Matthew McConaughey. <laughs> Seems our fairy godmother has turned the oppression of patriarchy and heterosexism into couture clothing and Photoshop pictures. Beauty and the Beast is an illusion that fell for a doodle like Zach Galifianakis. <laughs> the Little Mermaid is an illusion with bad decision-making skills that fell for a doodle who can't sell a boat. Where do we learn these things? I'm supposed to trust two shallow Ohio brothers named Grimm. Hold up, their names are Grimm, but you tell me they write fairy tales. You can't tell me ugly doesn't mean beautiful. <laughs> Sleeping Beauty was an narcoleptic. Snow White has snow white skin, red lips, and dark hair. That's a character on Twilight. <laughs> Propaganda and marketing has always been a part of political engagement, McCarthyism. Authoritarian leaders have been using deception since the beginning of time. Roswell was real. There were no WMDs. And we're still trying to figure out the after effects of Tuskegee. Now, you can follow along with the fallacy, but not me. I will no longer conform to the standards created by charlatans. So if you believe, then say it with me. U G L Y. I ain't got no alibi. I'm ugly. <laughs> Thank you. And here is my last story. And this is probably the one that has been the most inspirational, has been the most life-changing for me. Um, a dear friend who I discovered um, had survived breast cancer after seeing her pictures of her reconstructive surgery. And then I realized that she had blogged about her whole experience. And I saw some of the pictures. And the first thing that came to my mind was I have never seen anything so beautiful, just the confidence the aura, the glow, just she owned and accepted it. And I noticed that there were so many other survivors who were following her story, and there have been so many more that I've met because of this poem. So this is the last story I will share. And I share it to say that I feel that many poets, many artists feel like that the things that you go through need to be celebrated. They need to be explained. They need to be shared. And our job is to share that. And hopefully, you will be a poet's next inspiration. So with this, I leave you with this poem. And it is called Beautiful. I've never seen anything so beautiful. I've never seen anything so beautiful. I'm repeating this statement like spirituals in fields because hope lies in the harmony. Trying to restore the harmony she once knew when she sang strong songs that now seem off key, maybe off balance by the extra weight in her chest, she's off balance. She almost fainted when she found the lump. The doctor is conducting this examination. This breast cancer orchestra was a tragedy like Brahm wrote that CT scan, like Schubert wrote the biopsy results. Doctors offering encouraging quotes half empty and half full, like whole notes and half notes, but tell me, how will she feel whole with a chest half empty, self-worth half full? She drinks sunshine to replenish her spirit. Feeds herself scripture, prays, and stays faithful. She's a fighter. Determined to win and not let this claim her, she is modeling strength, will, and determination. And I have never seen anything so beautiful. I have never seen anything so beautiful. I'm repeating this statement like fight songs. As she marches from concern to my arms like Montgomery to Selma, knows that they were beaten, tear gas, hoes, had hounds set on them. She feels beat out of gas, tears falling, fear hounding her. But like them, she would not be turned back from believing she will overcome this. And I have never seen anything so beautiful. She takes my breath away, rubs her fingers down my cheek to my throat. She finds a lump. Her fingers dance along my throat like a surgeon's scalpel. She removes my confusion, so I speak how she lives past the pain. So that when I'm on stage, she's fighting her stage. I'm radiating eloquence. She's going through radiation. The stage is my therapy. She's going through chemotherapy. I've lost my patience with people rooted in ignorance. And she's lost her hair. But I've never seen anything so beautiful. 
Some consider it a shame. I consider it a symbol. I know that the first Amazons were from Libya, and I am looking at one of their descendants. I am in awe of her stature. She wears resilience on her face like war paint. Her smile is a battle cry. I'm inspired by the will to survive. In her eyes, I pull her close. It's like I'm holding the sun. Her bald head sets against my chest like an evening horizon, and I have never seen anything so beautiful. They could take her breast as long as they don't take her breath. An angel with one wing flies in a circle, so when she leaves my embrace, it means she will return to where she left. She is ruling style and fashion like Caesar, rocking Dulce and Gabbana glasses, earrings, and a Caesar. My kisses are my penance. Her laughter is my redeemer. I hang close so I can catch her if she falters, because baby girl is just a dreamer. I'm in awe of her makeup because she, she looks so good in a close fade and MAC makeup. An Augusta Savage sculpture, a beautiful work of art. She has commanded my attention, so I salute her and offer her my heart, because baby girl, I have never seen anything so beautiful.